I can barely believe it, but I'm now the owner of a race car. Let's discuss how that happened. I've loved motorsport for a long, long time now, and I actually have a race car of my own. And I thought it would be a matter of just having the money and going out and buying one, but the whole process took more like five or six months, and there was lots of different steps involved. So in this video, we're gonna go through how I afforded it, how I decided what I wanted to buy, and then the actual process of hunting it down and going to pick it up. I think it's best to start explaining why I wanted to sell this car, since I've had it since 2016 and absolutely love it. This is a 1993 Nissan S13 180SX, except it has the Sylvia front, which makes it a Silady, just like the one in Initial D. This is a true hero car of Japanese culture. This particular one is actually the fourth one of these I've had, and for many years I've documented owning them and modifying them on a blog. I found this car and the others to be crazy enjoyable, and I took it drag racing, did some skid pan drift days, but as I spent money on it over the years, it was appreciating in value and it was getting a little too nice to risk, especially after a closed door respray. And since parts were starting to get hard to find, I didn't want to risk trashing it with an accident. Add to that, with the stripped interior, stiff suspension and half roll cage, it wasn't exactly what you'd call street friendly, despite being legally registered to drive. So despite all the work and money I'd put into the car, I was barely using it. What really got things moving was having one of those race car experiences for my 40th birthday. It was only a two-seater Formula Ford, but I was actually a little bit surprised how fast it was. In the straight line, it was the same as the Silady, and it had way more grip in the corners, despite the track being damp. To summarize, it was pretty exhilarating. I went to some various track days, and I saw some cars similar to mine, and that just confirmed for me I didn't want to risk it anymore, so why not sell it and get something purpose-made for the track? So I put it up for sale with heaps of pictures and a tremendous amount of detail in all of the mods and spare parts that came with the car. If you've sold anything of value online, you'll know just how annoying it can be. And this was no different. I had probably 50 inquiries over six months, many of them wanting to swap, some trolls and plenty of time wasters. Finally, I found the right buyer and a deal was made. I did have to drop the price a bit, but I still got more than double what I originally paid for it. Finally, after many months, I could actually do something about buying a race car, and I was beyond excited. And let me tell you, anyone who would stand still long enough and couldn't escape, I would talk the ear off about how I was gonna buy this race car. So, what did I do next? It was time to go shopping, and the best website in Australia by far is called My105. There's some stuff on Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace, but all the dedicated race cars are found here but you might be noticing that race cars are very expensive. In fact, this set of wheels, $22,000 just for them. So what exactly was my budget? Selling the Silady was not my only source of money. I also sold this previous project car. I sold a box trailer I no longer needed. Also little things like these positioning jacks that weren't gonna work on a race car. And all of these things together gave me most of my budget, plus a little bit of savings. But what really helped was last financial year, for some reason, Google started putting aside tax for me in America, even though I was putting it aside myself in Australia. So instead of getting no tax return, I got a really good one. So my budget was around Australian 50,000, which is 33 and a half US. And I bet right now you're thinking that's a lot of money. But when it comes to motorsport, it's really not. For instance, if I was going to get something popular like a Radical that's near new, the price is going to approach $200,000. So whatever I got was going to have to be older, secondhand, and a lot cheaper. To narrow down the options, I thought long and hard about what I wanted and established some criteria. Firstly, the car had to be comfortably within budget, hopefully leaving around 10 grand to get trailers, safety gear, and other things that pop up. I also wanted a purpose-built race car, not a modified street car like I already had. No matter what, there's going to be small offs at least, and I don't want to get stuck at a panel beater. I'd rather patch up fiberglass. I wanted the car to be lightweight and agile, that's just personal preference. And I was pretty keen on having sequential shifting, because I much prefer to left foot brake. When driving the Sil80, I did heel and toe. I'm not amazing at it, but driving in my sim, I've got really used to left foot braking, and I see it as an essential technique. And that made me think that I probably wanted a motorbike or other cheap engine and gearbox. Firstly, this would mean it would be sequential. But more importantly, if I blew an engine up, worst case scenario, I go to a wrecker, buy a second hand one and put it in myself. 
I figured whatever I got needed to be at least as fast as the old car in terms of lap times. And to get the most out of this thing, I needed a clear pathway from doing regular track days to building up to some sort of friendly racing series. And last but not least, I have got a really steep driveway, so I needed to be able to get the car in and out. From this footage, you can kind of tell how steep it is, but it doesn't really do it justice. We've had people deliver things and got stuck doing burnouts trying to get back up, and the transition from slope to flat at the bottom is not exactly race car friendly. Even with all of these goals, there was actually quite a bit to choose from. And remember, it took half a year for the C80 to sell, so I had plenty of time to repeat this process. I would search online, identify cars that were suitable, research as much as I could, look up how fast they were, and then drive them on my sim if a mod was available. Let's look at my shortlist, and something there was heaps of available were Clubmans. These are little kit cars based on a Lotus 7, they're generally quite affordable, and depending on the motor and gearbox they had, they were fairly cheap. The problem with these is that they were generally H pattern and therefore not sequential. They can also be road registered so that didn't quite match what I wanted. Something else that ticked most of my boxes were Formula Fords. Some of these were quite expensive but then there was others for around 20 or 30 grand. Again these have an H pattern dog box so no sequential and no deal. Especially when the engines are fairly specialised and probably expensive to fix. I also decided at this time that I wasn't going to look at any historic cars as they need to be kept period correct and I wanted a little bit more freedom to modify and change things as I wanted. I was quite tempted by either a Legends or an Aussie race car. These have bike engines and sequential gearboxes. They also have a lock diff so there should be heaps of fun to chuck around. For the Legends you can race them on dirt or tarmac with a New South Wales series and this type of price is pretty typical for a Legends car. However, when I looked up lap times, it seemed they weren't really that much faster than what I was getting rid of. And that's the same reason I didn't look at Formula Vs. These were really affordable, but I just didn't think they'd be fast enough, and also, no sequential. Radicals had the bike engine and sequential gearbox, but they were generally above my budget. But there were similar cars that were eligible to race against them. The series being the New South Wales Super Sport Championship. It was comprised mainly of Radicals, but it also had some really other nice looking prototypes. They also had a New South Wales series with the majority of rounds being not that far away at Sydney Motorsport Park. I actually came really close to buying this thing, a Williams Sports Racer. It had a Hayabusa engine, sequential gearbox and it was already logged booked to race in this series. It's hard to explain how close I was to buying this car, but the sticking point was that ground clearance. 30 mils off the ground with no way to remove the front. There was just zero chance it was getting up or down my driveway, particularly unloading or loading onto a trailer. I spent a lot of time brainstorming this problem, but it was clear I would need significant modification to the car or structural changes to the garage. So it seemed pretty clear that I needed an open wheeler with removable nose cone. And for that type of car, there was the New South Wales Formula Race Car Association. Again, the majority of races were not too far from me and the rules of the series catered for Formula 3, Formula 4, as well as an open class for anything else. I got myself to Eastern Creek for the next available meet to check out the cars and meet some of the competitors. And it seemed pretty clear this was exactly what I wanted. Competitive, but not cutthroat. The members were also very friendly, and I have to give a big thank you to Greg, who's helped me through this whole process, being incredibly generous with his time. I really appreciate it. Most of the cars in the series were older Formula 3s, and typically these were well within budget. They were lightweight, high revving, had a sequential gearbox, but I was quite worried about ongoing costs with the specialized engine and transmission. These were highly tuned two litre race engines and if something went wrong, it was gonna cost me a fortune. The next most common car was a Formula 4. These were a lot newer and they had a Ford Focus engine, which shouldn't be that hard to get from a wrecker. They were also quite safe because they had a carbon fiber monocoque. This was probably my number one choice because the series is designed to be affordable, yet the problem was they pretty much never came up for sale. And this one that was within my budget because it came with a trailer, sold long before I was ready to buy. Browsing my saved search on my 105, there was another option that appeared, a Formula 1000. These were actually really popular in Western Australia five to 10 years ago, but the series has since run out of steam, with most competitors changing over to radicals. But that means there are some cars for sale. This type of car ticked pretty much all my boxes. They were small, lightweight, high revving, because I had 1000cc motorbike engines and the matching sequential gearboxes. Lap time wise, they were plenty fast, keeping up with Formula 3s and lap records that were often faster than V8 supercars. 
Best of all, they were eligible to compete in the open class for Formula Race Car New South Wales. I 100% would have purchased this car if it wasn't on the other side of the country. The price was great, especially since it came with a trailer, and it was also well maintained and came with a lot of spares. I didn't love the yellow colour, but of course I can change that later. Even though logistically this was too hard, a big thank you to Derek for answering many questions for me. I spoke to other people who were apparently selling other Formula 1000s, and when we had agreed on price and everything else like that, they just stopped replying. I was ready to buy this car, but I guess they weren't actually willing to sell. There was another Formula 1000 on my 105, but it had been for sale for 5 or 6 years, and that concerned me a little bit. On paper, however, it was amazing. It had a 1.3 litre Hayabusa engine, just like a Radical, and a bunch of other included electronics, like a camera, which was going to be very useful for setting up this channel. There was also only one picture available online, however I managed to find another after some Google sleuthing. This car absolutely nailed all of my criteria. Especially things like the sequential shift, because this actually had an aftermarket system that automatically blipped the throttle to rev match on downshifts, meaning you didn't need a clutch unless you were leaving the line. So we got negotiating and agreed on a price of 38000 So the car was picked and it matched pretty much all my criteria and all that remained was to pick it up. Now this was one of the closer ones to me, but it's still not really anywhere near me. So I had to work out the logistics of finding the time, organizing my best friend to help me carpool and then going to actually get it. Before I could pick up the car, I needed to actually buy a trailer. And this one I got for five and a half grand because it was unregistered in my state. That's about half the price to go for new, and luckily it didn't need much to get it registered. This is a tilter and it's got airbag suspension, and when you let that air out, the whole rear will drop down, giving an extremely friendly loading angle for race cars. So now onto the actual car, which was located in Canada. Canada is in the same state as me, but it's over 400 kilometers away, which is around 260 miles. That's five hours drive each way, plus stopping for meals and toilet breaks. This was going to be a significantly long road trip. If you're familiar with Australia, you'll understand that there's not much civilization outside of the coastal regions. So the vast majority of this trip was spent looking at landscapes. That made for a pretty scenic drive, but the roads were extremely bumpy. Fortunately, my best friend Dave came along with me so we could carpool and share the load. Eventually, we arrived in Canada at our destination. However, to make things more complicated, the seller of the car was currently overseas, so we would be dealing with his parents-in-law. Despite not being hugely familiar with the car, they were extremely helpful. And I tried to curb my excitement and have a good critical look at the car, working through the list Dave and I had created before leaving. There were some areas of the bodywork that were rougher than we expected, but it's a race car, it's low to the ground, it's going to have some wear and tear. What was really important was we couldn't see any leaks or problems with the engine and transmission. So after making sure I could actually fit, I transferred the money and I was the proud owner of a Speeds RM11 race car. But of course, we had to get the car home and there was a lot of tyres and wheels to load up on the trailer. My friend Dave and Daryl the father-in-law were incredibly helpful with this. And it took over an hour, but eventually we had everything safely strapped down. It wasn't long on the way back until the sun went down, and we were both quite nervous about the race car falling off the back of the trailer. But that airbag suspension was actually really good, and it wasn't long until we relaxed. Five hours later, we were back in my steep driveway, unloading the car. And with the nose cone removed, which is only four clips, transitioning from the trailer to the garage floor was surprisingly easy, only requiring a few wooden planks. This was the moment I knew I was absolutely right in buying an open wheeler over anything else. After six months of impatiently waiting for my old car to sell, I finally had my own race car sitting in the garage. And a huge shout out to Dave for helping make the journey possible. I never really liked the colour scheme of this car, but fortunately all of those coloured graphics were simply vinyl and could be peeled off. This was actually a pretty big job because it didn't really want to peel cleanly. But thanks to the help of my kids and wife, we got it done in two evenings. Now it's black and white, which matches the Teaching Tech colour scheme. And in the future, I'll be using my vinyl cutter to create some graphics for the livery. And that's the story of how I bought a race car. That whole journey was five or six months, and it kind of felt like it was closing. But in reality, it's just the beginning, because I still have to get my safety equipment, bring some things on the car up to date so I can actually drive it. 
And as much as I love it, it's still quite foreign to me. So in an upcoming video, we're gonna go through it bit by bit, pull all the bodywork off and discover exactly what's underneath with the aim of learning exactly how this thing works ahead of driving it for the first time. Senna once famously said, if you no longer exhaust all of your disposable income on buying a race car, then you're no longer a racing driver. And I didn't wanna upset any F1 legend, so that's exactly what I did. 